Hello, welcome back. In this video, we will be taking another look at the Cheddar Man controversy. If you remember, in the last video, titled Cheddar Man Debunked, we had to trawl through newspaper articles and web pages to try to understand what was behind the headlines. This was obviously less than ideal, because as we discovered, most of the coverage amounted to little more than science journalists referencing themselves or simply regurgitating Channel 4 press releases, rather than covering the science behind the headlines. And that was a major problem, because it soon became apparent that for many journalists, the headline was more important than the science. But now we have seen the documentary, which aired on Channel 4 on Sunday the 18th of February, and shortly after that, the University College London archaeological team released the paper itself, along with the data set relating to pigmentation. So in this video, we'll be taking a critical look at what was broadcast in the documentary and the science contained in the paper itself. If you recall, at the end of the last video, I said that I was not suggesting that the UCL study is wrong, that it might well be perfectly accurate. But I went on to qualify this by saying that in order for that to be the case, we would have to believe six impossible things. So now that the program has been aired and the paper is available, how many of these impossible things have the UCL team knocked down? Well, quite a few. Let's review the six issues raised in the order in which they were presented in the last video. The first impossible thing, that the sample DNA was remarkably well preserved in a cave system with groundwater present. Well, it looks as if the specimen was well preserved, but this is a relative term, and we shall be looking at this later. Second issue, that the sample produced complete DNA for analysis. This relates to the media claims that a complete genome had been recovered. Well, no, there is no complete genome as such, but that claim requires some explanation and it's related to the first. But don't worry, a general overview of the science is sufficient to understand what is involved, but it's something we will need to take a look at later. The third and fourth points raised were, and I quote, that the UCL team had accurately determined ancestral genes and then identified those genes in the sample. Well, this was a bit of a red herring. If you remember, this related to press statements attributed to one of the UCL team, Tom Booth. The whole commercial DNA test issue relates to the Channel 4 documentary's use of a commercial DNA testing company to find local people who might have Cheddar Man genes. Tom Booth, it seems, had excitedly discovered he shared a single gene that might indicate that he and Cheddar Man might share equally bad hairstyles. I don't think we should worry too much about this part of the program. It was more human interest rather than hard science. Point five, that the work of Brian Sykes is credible. Well, as it turned out, this was also a red herring. At no point in the documentary did the UCL team reference his work, and neither does the paper. So we can dismiss this point entirely. Lastly, point six, that the UCL team's agricultural hypothesis is sound. It's still nonsense, of course, but that is largely irrelevant because now our focus should be on what is claimed in the Channel 4 production and the paper on which it is based. Was this hypothesis offered as a general explanation, or was it simply media-generated noise? It's difficult to determine, but it's not included in the documentary or the paper itself. So let's set the vitamin D issue to one side. So, let's get to the meat of the issue. We need to start with something, so let's start with eye colour. What is the eye colour of Cheddar Man? The UCL team are focusing first on what Cheddar Man looked like. What colour or pigment were his hair, eyes and skin? I'm certainly aware that a number of people would have assumed that Cheddar Man was light, had light skin pigmentation. Now, skin pigmentation, the same as eye and hair pigmentation and the shape of hair and so on, these are things that are determined by a number of genes, not just one gene. And we know a lot of those genes. We don't know all of them, but we know a lot of the genes that influence skin pigmentation. And so we can, we can look at those and we can ask, right, uh, does he have the variants that is associated with lighter or darker pigmentation? And by putting those together, um, using algorithms that have been developed, for example, in forensics, we can get an idea of the levels of pigmentation in the eyes, the skin, and so on. 
first eye color. Research on modern DNA tells the team where the eye color genes, or markers, are. By comparing those to Cheddar Man's DNA, they get their answer. Result, Cheddar Man had blue eyes. So, blue. But what does the paper say? The paper is slightly more guarded. Page 4, paragraph 2, states that the prediction is that Cheddar Man might have had blue or green eye colour. That section states, and I quote, Cheddar Man is predicted to have had dark or dark to black skin, blue, green eyes, and dark brown, possibly black hair, whereas Venn most likely had intermediate to dark skin pigmentation, brown eyes, and black possibly dark brown hair. This is in line with the current hypothesis that alleles, commonly associated with lighter skin, were introduced in Western Europe by ANFs. In the next paragraph we have the following. We also analysed two previously published WHGs and find potential temporal and or geographical variation in pigmentation characteristics. Loch 22 from Luxembourg is 2,000 years younger than Cheddar Man and is predicted to have had intermediate skin pigmentation. Furthermore, the Loch individual most likely had blue-green eyes. So what we seem to have is a variation in skin pigmentation. Both Cheddar Man and the Loch individual were WHGs or hunter-gatherers. One it would seem with dark skin and one with intermediate pigmentation, both having blue or green eyes. Venn is also WHG and seems to share the same characteristics as the Loch Bohr individual. So, given the small size of the WG population, how likely is this variation in pigmentation? But it gets even more interesting, but we will need to play detective to discover why. Here is a screenshot taken from the Channel 4 documentary. On the laptop, there is displayed an email from one of the US genetics team. Here is a partial transcript of that document made by forum user toplobster at ansgenica.com. Key phrases that might be of interest are I have done the below individual as their coverage was much better. I only had three snips. Second issue was assuming zero for two sites that you were missing. RS12896399 genotype GG. If... RS12896399 had one or two T alleles present. Adjusting for the BNC2 RS107 56819, which also wasn't available, if it had the G allele present. Well, you get the picture I'm painting here. RS12896399 gene is related to hair colour and RS1075619 relates to pigmentation. There is a subtle distinction between a gene not being present and a missing loci or a missing gene sequence. This email suggests that the conclusions are highly speculative. In effect, they are guessing and trying out different surrogates in order to replace those SNPs that are missing from the sequence. The only thing we can be sure of is that the author certainly doubts that Cheddar Man had dark brown eyes. But why would there be missing sections? If, as claimed, the team had a full genome. And this is where we need to touch lightly on the science. In the first video, we looked at one of the major issues involved in using ancient DNA. We discovered that DNA had a half-life of some 521 years, and that Cheddar Man is around 10,000 years old. This would mean that only about 0.0007% of the DNA would have survived. This doesn't sound a lot, but remember that the human genome has over... 4 billion base pairs, so there would be some useful DNA present in the sample. The UCL team used state-of-the-art genetic procedures to recover as much of this information as possible. Each strand of DNA would degrade in slightly different ways. To take advantage of this, the geneticists prepared the sample, then amplified the DNA present. In effect, they cloned each fragment many times. In the end, they could have had millions of copies of each fragment. You might think about the product of this process as a soup of all the strands of DNA contained in the original sample. 
The amplified sample was then sequenced using a technique called shotgun sequencing. This is where the end sequences of each fragment is matched to another one, building up a complete genome. This is a highly processor-intensive process, and it gets its name from the random-like way the genome is sequenced. You may have already guessed that there is an issue here. Although this process maximises the sample DNA useful for sequencing, you cannot clone genetic material that is missing. In modern populations, this is not a problem, as geneticists now have large reference libraries of genomes. They can use templates, in effect filling in the gaps. This is more problematic in ancient samples. So this is why we should not be surprised when we learn that the genome of Cheddar Man is not complete. And it also explains in large part why the geneticists would be using another individual's genome as a template. At this point we don't know which library they're using as a template for the missing sequences. You might have guessed already that these techniques are mostly mathematical. There are many sophisticated statistical techniques being employed. These are well beyond the scope of this video, but a high-level conceptual overview would be helpful to understand why the UCL claims are dubious. This issue revolves around the predictive algorithms that determine pigmentation. We can actually look at the paper that describes these particular algorithms. If you look on the Frequently Asked Questions section for this topic on the National History Museum's website, there is a link to the paper. The paper is titled Global Skin Colour Prediction from DNA. Don't worry, we won't be going through the entire thing. We can focus our attention on a single table, Table 3. This table relates to the algorithm's performance. The section we are interested in is the 36 SNP section. Look at the sensitivity column. We see something that might be of interest. The more mathematically minded have already detected what the issue might be here. For the rest of us, let me explain what the figures mean. A sensitivity of 0.26 means that for every 100 people who have intermediate skin pigmentation, only 26 will be correctly identified, compared with 90 for blacks and 99 for whites. So this model is highly biased. If you're wondering about specificity, that indicates how accurate the positive results might be. If we have identified 26 intermediate individuals, then this determination will be 98% accurate. So I think that anyone, mathematician or not, can see that this method is not very sensitive to intermediate pigmentation, but is sensitive to white or black pigmentation. An odd choice for a study where it is already known that at least two individuals are intermediate. It's also worth noting that the sensitivity for intermediate pigmentation does not improve by increasing the number of SNPs. The 10 SNPs model has greater sensitivity in the intermediate range. Interesting, isn't it? We have, in effect, a combination of two potential problems. Firstly, the predictive algorithm is biased in that it performs poorly in identifying intermediate skin colours in humans based on mutation markers. Secondly, the Cheddarman sequence is missing three markers and is low coverage in another two mutations. Therefore, there is a total of five mutations that are highly speculative. This is significant because the predictive capability of the algorithm is dependent on three of the missing markers. So how is it that the UCL team are making unqualified pronouncements when such confidence is not supported by the science? and seems contrary to what is already known in relation to both Loch Bohr individual and the other member of the hunter-gatherer population, Ven. So, what's the verdict? Well, I have little doubt that the presentation of the characteristics of Chairman have been highly selective to say the least. The confident pronouncements made by the UCL team of archaeologists appear to be unsupported by the science, and seems at least in part to be driven by political motives. I have no doubt that over the coming weeks we will see their conclusions challenged in the relevant science forums. Now, obviously, I've only presented an overview in this video. It's not possible to cover the science in any detail. If you want to have a more detailed treatment, I would recommend two good sources, which will be included in the description box below. The first is a detailed discussion on Anthrogenica Forum by Jean Lozen, and the second link is to a new channel called It's All About QM. This channel has four short but detailed videos, which explain the issues surrounding the predictive algorithms.
Both content providers are qualified in the relevant disciplines. So, if you want to learn more, both are good places to start from. We end our adventure at this point. I hope you found something of interest in this video. If you would like to support my channel, I now have a Patreon page. If you're unable to support my works with Patreon, then you can share, like, or comment. It's all good. Thank you for watching.